Good morning. I am Elder Morris, and I am a member of the Fountain of Faith Baptist Church, address 7887 Beechnut, Houston, Texas, 77074. We meet in the chapel on the College Park campus. Our email address is fofbchouston.org. I'm doing a pre-recorded Sunday school lesson for first Sunday, May 3rd, 2020. Glad you could join and be here with me this morning. Please visit our website and view our church activities. And if you are seeking a church home, please come by and visit. Where we believe in quenching your spiritual thirst with God's word of truth. Let's open with a word of prayer and then get into our powerful lesson on Jeremiah 23, 1 through 8. Lord, we ask for your light this morning to illuminate our minds. Before we go any further, we want to apply your holy scripture, 1 John 1 and 9, where you said that we confess our known sins, you're just and righteous, to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Thanks for your word of truth, for you believe us worldwide. We want to be instructed by you. Speak, O oh Lord, and we will listen. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us this morning visit the streets of truth and righteousness. On that street corner lives our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has left for us his word of truth, the Bible. B-I-B-L-E. Basic instructions before leaving earth. This is the manual God has left for us to live our lives by. You know, if we go and buy some appliances, I bought a microwave, I got instructions on how to operate that microwave. When you uh, buy a car, you get an operating manual to explain to you how to how to operate the functions in that bill. So we get a manual for the things that we purchase because that person, that manufacturer that created that product knows how that, that, that product is supposed to function. And so God gave us the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, our manual, to teach us how to function. So we need, if we use that, then we would uh, benefit from it and be great believers and great Christians. Our scripture this morning is coming from Jeremiah 23, 1 and 8, 1 through 8, I'm sorry. And Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. We know that Jeremiah was a genuine lover of the Lord. Not only was he a genuine lover of the Lord, but he was a genuine lover of his people, Israel. And so it hurt him to see how sinful his nation was and how they disobeyed God. And he, he did all he could to hearken to them, to listen to God and follow his commands. So we'll see what happens in this lesson this morning. We'll begin with uh, chapter three, 23, verse one. It says, woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastor, saith the Lord. Therefore, saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. So here we see that the leaders, the pastors that God has put in charge over his people to guide them and to instruct them, they are not following God's commands. Our lesson aim this morning is to confirm that God is in control of all things, including people at the highest levels of leadership. That means God is in control of the president, the emperors in Europe, 
uh, the governors, the mayors, God is in control. Those individuals may be uh, assigned to carry out their duties in their office, but God is in control of everything that, ha that happens. There's nothing that occurs that God is not aware of. Then our principle is God demands that those in leadership submit to his ultimate authority and not act independently of him. God wants us to follow his directions. God gave us this Bible to tell us how we're supposed to live. And he wants us to be humble to him. He wants us to, to uh, follow his commands. And, and that's not what we do. And then our application is, leaders should look to God for guidance, direction, and wisdom on how to lead those he has put in their care. And if leaders would listen to God, if they would follow his direction and listen to his wisdom, then our world would be in a much better place. But we are where we are. Uh, the time is about 597 BC, the place is Jerusalem. I go to sex says, but I go to text says, Behold, the day come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Then we have our introduction, and in our introduction, I'm going to paraphrase it in the instance of time. In today's society, we can relate to politicians running for office, and invariably they claim they are seeking office solely to perform duties for the good of the people. This is a foreign concept transcendent from our Master and Lord Jesus Christ, who came to earth and demonstrated how to live in humility and serve his fellow man. During biblical times, kings, monarchs, emperors, pharaohs, did not rule with this concept in mind. This rule was based on selfish motives, what was in their best interest, and how you could serve them. They were at the top, and everybody else was on the bottom. So those monarchs and those kings, they had uh, no compassion for people. They were brutal. They didn't care anything about how the people felt. All they were concerned about was their own selfish needs. How could they be served better? How could they build their kingdom better? How could they be, uh, how could they be honored? How could you glorify them? They were not concerned about the people. And even though our politicians today tell us, uh, they may say these words, uh, that they, they're invariably in office to serve the people, but when we see the, the condition of our nation, and we see parties, both parties, no matter which one you, you're in, if you're in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, it don't matter. Our country is still where it is today because of the people that were put in those positions that were supposed to serve the people that are not doing that. And we are where we are today because of that. Our two lesson outlines, the need for pastoral care, Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4, and the coming of the shepherd, Jeremiah 23, 5 through 8. This word, woe, indicates that the Lord is greatly disturbed and dismayed with the, uh, with the uh, condition of the nation of Israel. In, in this first verse, he said, woe unto the pastors, which means that God, this, this is an emotional thing. This, this is a pain. It's, it's the same example as when you have a child and you are giving your kid instructions to do things and they continue to do things in a manner that you have not instructed them. So this is the same thing that's happening with uh, Israel. The scripture was uh, the, uh, written sometime during the reign of Zedekiah, the last king of Judah during the captivity of Nebuchadnezzar. During the short reign of Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin, immorality, evil, wickedness, and sin prevailed. Now we know that Israel wanted a king like other nations, and God allowed them to have a king. 
But these kings, that go, even though they had kings to rule over them, they still did not follow the blueprint that God had in place. They continually failed the leadership test. The scripture today is clearly pointing out the importance of leadership and how it impacts the subjects. As leadership go, as it said, so goes the people. We see the kings leading the people into sin, great sin and idolatry, infesting the nation of Israel. There's a lack of godliness and righteousness. And, and it's not leadership that glorifies God. God takes leadership seriously of his people whom he loves dearly. Every facet of leadership has fallen into corruption and immorality. The priests, the prophets, and the leadership. They have scattered his flock, and he is going to chastise them for their diligence. Now we know the Lord has told uh, 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 in Matthew 12 and 30, he says, you're either with me or you're against me. You can't straddle the fence. You can't, you, you can't be on the left side and the right side. You got to make a choice. Either you're going to serve God or you're going to serve men. That's the choice that you have. God is rebuking the pastors that is not discipling the lost. Woe to the pastors that is not going out and visiting the people and teaching them. God holds the, the pastors and leaders to a high standard. God expects you to go out and reach out and find, find the lost, those that are, are, are not believers. The pastors are not preaching what should be preached, and they are filthy. You are preaching and teaching things that I did not tell you to teach. The Lord wants his pastors to preach and teach the truth. You must preach the whole gospel. The whole gospel is not the watered down gospel. The whole gospel is sin will be punished. God expects his leaders to tell people about the condition that dishonors him, which is sin. God has a problem with sin. And if you're not preaching the whole gospel telling people about sin, God has a problem with you as a leader. Hell is real. God wants you to know that hell is real. There was a flood that God told them that was coming. They didn't believe it. And God is telling us that there's going to be hell. And it's going to be a burning fire. And it's real. But still, his leaders, his priests, his preachers are not giving people the 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 word, the whole gospel that he, he desires them to teach. They're exploiting the, the underprivileged, the vulnerable, and it's wrong. There's only one way to salvation. Yeah. Many of them tell it, saying there's many ways to, to Christ. That's not what the Bible says. John 14 and 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's only one way to Jesus Christ. That's it. There's no other way. Your works will not save you. Not, your works are not going to get you into heaven. It ain't nothing you can do to, 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 to grant you a pass to heaven. Nothing. The only thing that's going to get you into heaven is what Jesus did for you. That's it. We must walk by faith and not by sight. In life, there's tribulation, there's struggle, there's persecution. But we, we have leaders that are not sharing this with people. They're not sharing with people that there's going to be struggle and persecution. We have to teach the whole gospel. That's what God expects us to do. We spend so much time worrying we are fearful to live in God's presence. Conquer your fear with faith. Worrying replaced by prayer equals trust. Philippians 4, 6, 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not worry about anything, but pray and ask God for everything you need. And he always gives, and always give him thanks for the hope that's in you. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, 
which is a, a scripture that we live on, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. He will direct your path. The Lord is going to hold leadership accountable. However, it does not exonerate you. It does not ex exonerate me. It does not exonerate us from our responsibilities. Because we're supposed to study, as, as 2 Timothy 2 and 14 says, study to show yourself approved, a workman not needed to be ashamed, correctly dividing the word of truth. In Malachi 1, uh, 1 and 6, the Lord says, a son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is my honor due me? If I am a master, where is my respect due me? It is you, O priest, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we defiled you? You have placed defiled food on my altar. So they were taking sacrifices, putting it on God's altar, crippled animals, blind animals, spoiled animals, the leftover animals they were putting on God's altar. God said, how, how are you honoring me? How, how, how are you respecting me? You're, you're not, would you give this to your governor? Would you give this to your president? Would, would you take this to your home? No, you, you wouldn't do this. But these are the things that you do to me and disrespect me and dishonor me and defile my name and yet, I'm not supposed to have a problem and I created you. God is not happy with those type of our, our sacrifices. I mean, it could, be, it could be with us, it could be time. I mean, we have time for everything other than what God needs us to do. When Jesus was here on earth, he was a servant leader. A servant leader. He demonstrated how he expects us to, 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 to live as Christians, as believers. He demonstrated that to us. And so we are expected to be servant leaders. We're expected to serve and teach and find the lost. That's what God has given us assignment to do. Ezekiel 34, 1 through 16, the Lord God Almighty told Ezekiel, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel and say to them, this is what the Lord God Almighty says, woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of their flock? You eat the curds, you dress in fine clothing and slaughter the animals, but you do not take care of your flock. You have not strengthened the weak, you have not healed the sick, and you have not bound up the you have not bound up the injured. God is not satisfied with this. When we do things that only are self-serving, things that only uh, uh, things that only are only for us, and then we want to be puffed up and we want to be praised for what we do. God is not satisfied with that. God went on to say, you have ruled them harshly and brut with brutality, and my sheep have scattered because there is not a shepherd. So because of the way they've been handled, they've been scattered. And we know that Israel was scattered all over the land. And it was because the shepherds were not doing their job. They were not being responsible. They were not taking on the task that God had given them to take care of. The Lord promises more than just condemnation for the irresponsible shepherds. He is going to raise up new shepherds. And we know the Lord is always going to raise up a remnant. And he's going to personally gather the flock from all the countries to which he has driven them into judgment. He is going to bring them back to their fold where they are protected and can be prosperous and increase in numbers. He is going to replace the irresponsible leaders with faithful leaders who will be obedient and glorify him. The sheep 
would no longer have to fear and none would go missing a loss. The ultimate fulfillment of God's promise in our text today is yet to come, but the Lord will raise up a remnant until Jesus returns and take over the flock. Going on with our lesson here, we see that uh, verse 3 it says, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries, whether I have driven them, and will bring them again to their foes, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. The Lord is always going to provide for us. We have to stay faithful. We have to stay, we have to stay in God's uh, word. And we have to continue to uh, uh, trust God. Trust God that he's going to deliver us. Jeremiah speaks of a future time, possibly the end times, when a king will remedy the problem of irresponsible leadership. And he will rule with perfect justice and righteousness. But until that time, there will be faithful shepherds God will raise up to lead his sheep until that ultimate shepherd returns. Yes, Jesus will return again to set up his kingdom in the millennium. He will rule for a thousand years. For the sake of time, uh, there are some scriptures that you can refer to. Isaiah 65, 20 through 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, and Revelation 20, 1 through 15. When the Lord our righteousness arrives, Judah and Israel will be protected, and the flock will be returned to the fold. It will be a time of complete deliverance from strife, fear, and want. In him the glory of the Lord is revealed, and only through him can sinful men and women have hope of seeing that glory and sharing in it. Under his reign, there will be complete peace and safety the kind that comes from the Lord's character, being known to all. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness. He will judge the needy with justice. He will give decisions for the poor of the earth. These promises in Jeremiah's day were very important because it gave them hope. God promises meant he would bring them back into their land and bless them again. The new era of peace ushered in by the Lord our righteousness will exceed all other transitions to the promised land. The mass migration of Israel from Egypt led by Moses will pale to the gathering of Lord's migration during the great white throne judgment. The peace and safety for Israel that Jeremiah prophesies is yet to come. It will arrive, however, at the second coming of Christ when he establishes his kingdom on earth. Let us pray. Lord, as we conclude this lesson, we want to give you the honor and praise. And thank you for revealing, to your, so revealing your sovereign wisdom that we may share with the laws to open their hearts and minds to your purpose for our lives. Lord, increase our faith to trust you during the time of pestilence, knowing that you are in control and you are working things out for our good. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, our church address is 7887 Beechnut, Houston, Texas, 77074. And our email address is fofbchouston.org. Thank you this morning for joining me for this lesson.